Got it? Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining um, today. First off, I want to start by apologizing to any football or soccer fans out there. I know that the World Cup is game is starting right now. Um, that was not intended as a slight to anyone. It was just a scheduling mishap. Um, so I'm going to apologize about that. Um, Second, I'm Miles McGonigal. I am the one of the co-chairs for the Engineering and Innovation Working Group. And this is our quarter two. We try and have quarterly stakeholder meetings. Um, and we'll get into that here in just a minute. Um, uh, but just, yeah, just real quickly about myself. I work for C-Corps International um, in Miami itself. Um, and, and ultimately, tangentially related to coral restoration and engineering. And as I mentioned previously, for those that weren't on the call, okay. kind of one of these interesting characters is kind of We need nexus, to send David back. Uh, nexus of coral restoration and engineering and trying to help build this, the, the network within it. Um, and so what we're gonna aim to do today is I'm gonna give a few, uh, just an intro to the EIG for those that are um, unfamiliar give some updates about what our group is working on, get a quick icebreaker, and then we'll go into forest presentation and have any time at the end for uh, any questions that people might have. Um, so the vision of the, the engineering and innovation group is to, is to help facilitate innovation for coral reef restoration by acting as a bridge between practitioners and industry, something that um, isn't necessarily utilized as uh, to the full extent that it could be. Um, and we're trying to help build the bridges within that. Um, and we've got a whole gui community guidelines document that we uh, have posted on our on the CRC website, which I'll have a link to here in a minute, if anybody's interested in checking it out. Um, and we do these stakeholder meetings as an opportunity to uh, build collaboration and networking within the community um, with different, by increasing awareness of new existing emerging innovations within coral reef restoration. Um, so hoping to uh, ultimately give people a flavor of what all is out there um, for those that are involved in coral restoration, for those that aren't, hoping to make you aware of what is and maybe opportunities to get involved. Um, so in terms of updates uh, on innovation initiatives that the EIG is currently working on, um, just recently, Reef Futures, which is a conference that is held by the Coral Restoration Consortium, was at the end of September, and I had multiple people come up to me and ask, hey, will you help me write a position description for hiring an engineer? They don't, people who don't necessarily, in Coral Restoration, don't necessarily know what those qualifications need to be um, to be able to even hire someone on to support their organization. And so as, it, as the EIG, we're working on a, a document, ultimately a PDF, trying to define some position qualifications that would be valid for um, organizations looking to hire an engineer to work in coral restoration. And so that, that's something we're aiming for the beginning of 2023, having published to the CRC website, right there is the link crc.world. Um, Brooke or, or Megan or Brooke, would you mind sending that link out in the chat to those that might be interested in looking at it? Um, and is Deepak on the phone by any chance? Deepak is here. Awesome. Yes. So uh, Deepak, I'm going to let you talk to these, uh, to Coral Tech and the soft launch that is currently, that is um, upcoming. Sure. Thanks, Miles. Yeah, just, just hopped on. I thought we are going to catch you at the right time. Um, but yeah, so Coral Tech is still in progress, um, but we have a soft launch that's out. So you are able to visit the website, like uh, Miles mentioned, uh, just uh, coraltech.world. Um, we can hop to the next slide, next, uh, slide here. Yeah, so soft launch, uh, you can go check out the website. I encourage everyone here to check it out. Always looking for feedback. Um, but what you'll see on there, the, the mobile app, desktop app, should it work for Windows and Mac OS. Um, we can check out like the existing projects that are on there. We had a, a, a very rough um, initial uh, request for information. And we had, I think about seven or eight projects that are listed on there right now. So you can check it out, familiarize yourself with the formats, give us our, your feedback on what kind of information there is useful or not um, from your perspective. Now you can also see the glossary of terms there. If anything seems unclear, let us know. 
Um, if you are working on any projects, um, the links to actually submit ideas, any projects you're, that you're working on that you think might be a good candidate for Coral Tech, um, you should be able to also submit your projects there as well. Um, so if you do, if you are interested in submitting ideas, do um, try that link and try to submit through there. It's a very quick, like seven or eight questions on there. Um, it's a high level overview of what you're working on. Um, that'll give us an idea of, uh, make sure everything's working. Um, and also, uh, but do reach out and let us know if you do use that. Um, and just in general, the get in touch, contact us form is also there. Do reach out to us um, with any other feedback you do have. Um, and Deepa, just for those that yeah. might not be aware, could you give just a quick definition of what Coral Tech is? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, like I have on the slide here. Um, so Coral Tech is, is, a, is an online database, basically or a catalog of all the international restoration technologies that we have or that we're aware of through our networks. And so we are kind of crowdsourcing this knowledge gathering effort and using Coral Tech as a way to collect all that information so that the international community can readily access and be aware of all the different tools and practices that are being put in place and or are in development. Um, so people can see what things are coming in the future and how we can plan our restoration efforts with those in mind. Um, so this will be publicly accessible. You should be able to browse it wherever you are in the world um, and get kind of uh, a pulse on what's up and coming in, in the Coral Tech space. Um, to support yeah. Coral Tech, oh, go ahead, Miles. Oh, I was just gonna make the point that as well, that, you know, this is ultimately going to um, support that mission that we have of, of bridging that connection between um, practitioners and industry. So it could be an opportunity that if it, there is something out there practice that you want to develop it, but don't have the know-how, the technology, the funding, anything to do, it could be published up on Coral Tech. And then people that are interested in supporting Coral Restoration would be able to see, oh, hey, this is something that is needed to be developed. Um, this is something that I know how to do. And then have you know maybe contact information or opportunities to build some sort of collaborative effort going towards those different innovations or, or technologies that are needed, could be used, are wanted, or do exist out there. Um, so it, it aimed at being a, just a non-biased, not saying this is the best thing to do, it's just a, a central repository of things that do exist out there and things that we want to exist. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, so kind of in that, as we're wrapping this up and getting out, there's obviously soft launches here, so you can see, you get a feel for what's out there and how the tool is working. Um, we're also ramping up and hopefully being able to uh, release this fully in, in uh, early spring, 2023. Um, but in the meantime, uh, kind of support you know, these last stages here, as well as kind of the future maintenance of the system. Um, we are looking for either volunteers or even like paid internship opportunities. There are open as so if anyone here, if you know anyone that might be, um, has some background in like website development, particular Wix um, or the SQL, different kinds of coding languages for databases. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me directly or, or to Miles as well. Um, those are, these are opportunities either through Valor Robotics or through CRC itself um, to support um, Coral Tech in the long term. Um, so if you're interested, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you very much, Deepak. Absolutely. Um, Thanks, so just a, a couple of quick announcements here. Um, if you're interested in keeping up with CRC updates, there's at the on the CRC website that Brooke sent out the link earlier. You can sign up there to uh, get any updates about what's going on. Um, and refutures, as I mentioned, that just happened in September. All of the virtual content will be available on the CRC YouTube channel. Um, they're aiming to have that up, I think, early next year. So we will keep everyone apprised of that. But just be aware that everything that was presented at refutures. The CRC is aiming to make available publicly to everyone. Um, and then just a quick plug, we try and do these stakeholder meetings every quarter. If you have ideas, would like to present or know of someone that you think should present, um, you can reach out to our secretary, Megan Ramirez, um, at crc.eig at gmail.com. And so with that, um, we've got a quick, uh, I'm going to send a link out here in the chat for everyone to please join. Um, and so I've got a quick icebreaker. The idea here is once you click that link, you're gonna be put into this Google Jamboard. 
Um, and I've got this green sticky note here in the middle of what I would like everyone to do. There's a little sticky note icon over on the left. If you click that, it will give you this dialog box to fill in um, where we want you to fill in this information of the name of your institution, the, your name, the institution you work with, location that you're in, and what technology do you wish existed? And once you do that, you can press save. And then I would like you to locate your sticky note in which one of these quadrants you think applies to who you are with respect to the coral restoration community. Are you a practitioner? Are you an engineer that is you know, looking for ways to get involved? Are you a manufacturer? Are you something else? Um, I didn't include researchers in this as a, as an, as a specific category because I didn't have enough. And I was just trying to make this simple. Um, but I think there's probably multiple classifications that fit in that other category. Uh, but again, we'd love everybody to uh, fill out a sticky note with this button over here on the left side. It says sticky note with your name, the institution that you work with, where you're located, and what technology you wish existed for coral restoration. Um, no, pensé que tuviese volumen alto. And if anybody has questions, let me know. The idea here is just trying to get a pulse on who all we have here um, and the, 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 where you're coming at us from. Name, location. And I just put in the chat what we're looking for you to fill in because I think somebody hijacked my, uh, my sticky note there. Our, our template one. So I just want to say this is Sheila that like I've I completed my sticky note and it's it's invisible on my screen so I can't move it. It should be I'm the pink note and it should be on the engineering side. I have it's opaque to me. <laughs> thank yeah, you the, whoever whoever moved board, that. Thank you. Is not ideal for this, but it's the best free opportunity to do something like this that that we've found. Um, so give people a, a little bit, a couple more minutes here. Um, read off a couple of these. Nick, I want a better ways to collect and sort individual larvae for automatic handling. Interesting. That is a, a challenge in itself right there. Taylor, looking for self-cleaning nursery technology for fouling and pests. There's actually a couple of those that do exist out there currently. One is uh, in one in development is actually on Coral Tech right now. There's the Charm robot. Um, it's actually pretty fascinating. There's another group down that works along. They're, they're testing stuff with Moat called Sea Foundry, I believe. Brooke, cor correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, that does uh, things similar to that. Um, Colleen, petrol-free zip ties. I do wish those existed. Um, See what else we got in here. Got some great, uh, great participation here. A lot of different sticky notes. Really appreciate everybody for joining in. Um, this is something you know. Just like to get an idea for everyone that is here, um, because going around the room and having everybody unmute and chat in, ends up being quite a bit. Um, but really appreciate everybody for filling this in. Would highly encourage anyone to browse through this um, afterwards. Uh, for the time being, we'll go ahead and uh, continue on, though, um, and uh, just thank you, everybody, for, for touching in on this. Love to see that there are people at the nexuses of these different quadrants that we put up here as well, though. Um, so next, uh, we do have our presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Sheila to do an introduction for us. And Forrest, if you want to start sharing your screen, you can go ahead. All right, thanks very much, Miles. The first thing I want to say before introducing our speaker today is I really want to reinforce Miles' last point on um, 
collecting suggestions from all of you and from the entire community on not just speakers you'd like to hear from, but also topics. Uh, you don't need to have a speaker in mind. If there is something that you're interested in hearing about, uh, it's probably the case that other people in the community are also interested in hearing about it. So don't feel like you need all the answers. It's okay to send a vague email that says somebody like X or a topic like Y and let us do the work. Uh, that's the whole point of, of the group being here. So with that, um, let me go on to introduce uh, Professor Forrest Rower. Um, Professor Rower is a faculty member in biology at San Diego State University, and he has been very prolific scientifically, uh, one of the founders of the field of viromics. Um, he has received multiple uh, national and international recognition for his work, uh, has published prolifically, and is a fellow of multiple um, uh, scientific societies. Uh, now, I got the opportunity to meet him when um, I was working on a large scale, um, very, very forward looking coral restoration program uh, several years ago. And we were really looking for ideas that were um, outside the box, maybe 10 years down the road, uh, things that may have sounded crazy at the time. And uh, we kept hearing, you need to go talk to Forest Rower. Uh, so we did, and I and my entire team were fantastically impressed and excited with what he was doing. So I was very pleased that he accepted our um, invitation to speak and to bring us up to speed on developments in this area. I see already just on this video that things have moved along quite a bit since uh, I last heard about them. So we're very much looking forward to um, learning more and hearing the updates. So with that, Forrest, I'd like to pass things over to you. Okay. Sounds good. Everybody can hear me, I hope. Thumbs up from, okay, good. All right, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the biology and hopefully some of the engineering things that we've been going uh, doing. Um, if you can kind of watch the chat box for me, someone, and um, take questions as we go, um, I don't mind at all. So. The starting point for me, of course, is uh, at the viruses. Um, I, I tend to work from the viral point of view. And the this story uh, really starts with the healthy coral reefs, which usually have lots of uh, really big fish. And um, that having a whole bunch of feet big fish means that you have to have a whole bunch of grazers um, that are eating the algae, which are then being eaten by the big fish. So this trophic structure moves energy from the benthos up into the uh, water column in the in the form of fish biomass. And key to this uh, whole thing is the coral holobiont, which consists of the animal, which is doing the belly and the skeleton, and then the zooxanthellae, which are living inside of it, which are uh, they uh, the zooxanthellae when they do photosynthesis feed oxygen and um, and sugar to the coral, which allows them to build the skeleton. And that's how they build the structure that's the coral reef. Um, when we overfish, uh, what happens is we basically uh, take away the grazing pressure. So now we don't have a lot of grazing on the algae and you start to get the rise of the algae, uh, first turf algae followed by macro algaes. And algae is different than a coral because um, when it does photosynthesis, the oxygen bubbles away. So you start retaining organic carbon on the reef and you lose oxygen. And that's uh, basically a great place for microbes. And what happens is we end up with a whole bunch of fat microbes that are living, um, uh, that are growing there. And in the, these particular cases, the viruses start hanging out with the microbes. So rather than killing the microbes, they hang out with them. And this produces a uh, assembly, which is called a lysogen. And lysogens are the coral pathogens. And that's why the corals actually die. And this process is what we call microbialization. And the reason that this is uh, uh, getting worse, of course, is it's not just overfishing now and, uh, and eutrophication, but also we're starting to see the higher water temperatures, which retain less oxygen, and acidification, which is um, feeding CO2 to the, to the algae. So all of this also increases uh, uh, microbialization. 
So those of you who aren't really familiar with viruses other than not liking them lately because they've been causing us trouble. Um, so every virus out there has to, basically they float around as a, in a virion form and they run into the cell that they're gonna uh, infect and that's called an absorption step. And then they inject their nucleic acids. So this can be DNA or RNA and infect. And then they can make a choice. Uh, most of them can make a choice. They can either just like take over the cell and replicate and make a whole bunch of themselves and uh, then blow up the cell. So that would be called what we would call the lytic life cycle. That's what, like what COVID's doing with us right at the moment. But the other thing they can do is they can go in and they can actually become part of the cell and they can replicate with the cell. Um, and that's as a pro-virus or a prophage if you're talking about the ones that infect the bacteria. Why this is important to us is when bacteria or when phage decide to hang out with their bacteria, um, they're, they actually kind of um, form the symbioses and they actually have to protect the unit of the lysogen. So the bacteria plus the prophage inside of it from anything that might eat it. And to do that, they produce things that we would call virulence factors. And this is how you get opportunistic uh, uh, pathogens. And so this is uh, all the bacterial pathogens you've ever heard of. They are carrying prophage around in them and they're getting this, uh, these um, uh, virulence factors from the phage that are living inside them. Okay. So if you take this and you start thinking about like what's going on in a coral reef, this is an example of how we actually go measuring it. And when we go out as you down here in this little, uh, in the thing that looks like the, the stars and the, the uh, suns is basically what we've done is we've taken a, a mill of seawater, we've filtered it down and we've captured the bacteria and the viruses on the filter. Then we stain them with a DNA stain and then we can count them. And so all the small dots are gonna be the number of viruses and all the big dots are the bacteria. And this gives us what we call the VMR or the virus to microbe ratio. And if we look across a whole bunch of different ecosystems, what we notice is that the more bacteria we have, the fewer number of viruses we have infecting them. So the VMR, the ratio goes down. Okay? And that's telling us that the, instead of killing the cells, the viruses are hanging out as proviruses. This is something we call piggyback the winner. And so we call these piggybacking viruses. So the more that this is happening, the more potential pathogens you have. Okay? And these VMRs are actually the best predictor of coral cover, right? So this is a, uh, uh, where we've taken a whole bunch of data. Um, in this case, it's all from the NOAA uh, uh, ramp cruises. And so there's about a hundred, over a hundred sites here. And we've taken everything that everybody's measured and we've just asked, so what are the best uh, predictors of coral cover? And as you can see, it's always the viruses and the bacteria. Okay. And then there are different uh, places, depending on where you're looking at, sometimes herbivores are important, uh, sometimes alkalinity, but those two together are always the best predictors. And then when you put them in the ratio, then you end up really, um, uh, really uh, uh, making it, it bigger, right? So if you kill a whole bunch of virus, uh, bacteria off by having a whole bunch of viruses produced, that virus to right microbe ratio gets higher. All right, so the other thing that we know is that we can cause the viruses to become lytic by adding some oxygen. So this is just an experiment where we've uh, taken in an aquarium and where we've got this red line, we've added some oxygen. And what happens is you'll see that the viruses, uh, the VMR goes up in this particular case. That shows that if you add, if you increase oxygen, you uh, should be able to reverse that microbialization state. Okay. So that takes us to um, the Coral Reef Arc project. So one of the uh, easiest ways to get more oxygen um, uh, on a reef system. So remember the reefs are microbialized, so there's lower oxygen down on the bottom there. Um, and so we built these floating structures, um, which are called the arcs. And there's two types. Um, the ones here on the left are the, uh, the I call them the barks, 
because the guy that invented him or designed him was Bart Chadwick. And um, they're hanging out um, in uh, Puerto Rico at the moment. And then these are the marks, are the, the ones um, more to the uh, to the right here. And that's because Mark Hattie invented them. And in both cases, they're uh, up, they're floating in the water column. So what we've got is more oxygen compared to the reef uh, right next to it. Okay. This is just uh, for those of you that care about things like this, this is about how much they uh, th it takes to build the, the mark in this case. And of course, they have like all of these nice things from an engineering point of view. Um, they're relatively, they're super robust. They're relatively cheap to build. You can just move them around. And of course, geodesics are a great way of effectively enclosing a volume with very little bit of material. Okay. We also have done um, some of the, uh, the main things that you would do. This was uh, done by Lou's lab here at SDSU, um, where we put them in uh, flow chambers and just looked at the flow regimes around them. And kind of what you would expect, we get um, faster flow over the top of them where the, uh, where, so that would cause more oxygen to be delivered to the top and the bottom of the, uh, the structures, whereas the middle part of it has a much lower water flow. And so they tend to have uh, the things where uh, design characters were, were looking for. Okay? And of course, we do find that they actually do what we expect. So here is uh, the arcs. These are the ones in Curacao. And what we're doing here is we're just looking at different uh, oxygen at different sites, and then we're comparing it to the seafloor. And in this case, the arc is sitting just off the reef, and then uh, we're measuring at the same depth. So there's no difference in depth, or even the main water mass is moving past it. And what you'll notice is that the arc has higher uh, oxygen contents than does the seafloor right next to it. Okay. So this looks like it will do what we want. and What's nice is that we get the biological response we're looking for. So this is where we're looking at the VMRs um, on those arcs and comparing them against the seafloor using that same counting technique. And what we see is that um, the virus to microbe ratio is higher on the arc and lower on the seafloor. Okay? Again, lower VMRs means that we have more pathogens, higher VMRs means that we have fewer pathogens. Okay? And so this is a good state variable. So if you're looking at ways when you're doing engineering, um, this VMR is a really good way of asking what are the bacteria and the uh, viruses smelling in the environment. The other thing that Did you, did I get muted? You, you're back now. Sorry about that. Where did I cut out at, Shelly? Just as soon as you went to the slide. So just start over on the okay. slide. Okay, cool. So then the other way to look at this is um, uh, to think about also spaces, right? Because if you don't, if you have a whole bunch of primary production and in a small space, what will happen is that the bacteria will use up the oxygen and you'll end up again in a microbialized state. So if you're trying to think about what, how you would design systems to put out on a coral reef, the amount of uh, oxygen and the water flow and so forth is going to be really important. So what we did is we built these things called arms, which are just these structures, these little smaller substructures that we put on the coral reef, uh, sorry, on the arcs. And um, we, in this case, build them out of uh, a travertine uh, with different hole sizes. And then we just look to see what happens over time. And what's important here is that the smallest holes that we put in there, which are about two centimeter sizes, um, within about uh, the first couple months that they're out there, start to biofoul. And you can see it down here in this, uh, this picture. But what's happening is that the viruses are uh, are uh, behaving as if they do on a degraded reef because they're in these lower oxygen conditions or the, they're helping create these lower oxygen conditions. So this gives you some sort of design element that really um, 
if you are below about a two centimeter hole, you're probably going to start causing microbialization. Um, when we get a little bit of, uh, uh, bigger than that, like up into about the four centimeter, then we see much less signal of this. Oh, oh, now I decided to. Yeah. Okay. And this brings up kind of a geometry challenge, um, which is that the smaller holes are going to increase microbialization, right? But animals tend to prefer holes that they can just fit into, right? So this is a, for the protection point of view. So this is an example of urchins. They'll jam themselves into something that they just barely fit into. So what we've been doing is we've been doing these 3D uh, printing of a fractal of uh, the platonic forms. So the idea is to give us all these different uh, different sizes, um, as well as all of the main uh, geometric forms. Then we're putting these out on the arcs, and then we're going to be tracking what sorts of animals uh, do they actually really prefer certain sizes and certain shapes, and also looking at um, the uh, what's happening to this virus to microbe ratio. The other thing that we're doing, of course, is just putting uh, corals on the arcs to serve as arcanaries. Okay? And this gives you a fill. This is These are ones from the um, site in Puerto Rico. And you can see over time, um, we're getting quite a bit of coral growth on the arc, whereas on the control site, um, which is still at the same uh, depth and everything at the same place, um, what we're getting is most of the corals are actually dying. So overall, what we're seeing is survival is better on the arcs and that they're growing much faster by being up in that uh, water column. Okay. And they actually uh, survived uh, for those engineering types. Uh, they, these arcs survived um, the hurricane and the corals sitting on top of them. There were, some of them broke off, but most of them survived. So this is what it looks like after uh, the summer, whereas all the corals that were on the uh, benthos in this particular place are uh, died. Okay. The other thing that I really like about the arcs is that they give you uh, a great, uh, again, another very strong state variable for studying coral reefs. So coral reefs have to calcify to actually live, right? So they have to be building up faster than they're being eroded. And if you have some a floating structure in the water, you've got your push, your uh, buoyancy is pushing you up. So what we can do is we put, or what we do is we put a strain gauge um, between the, the arc itself and the anchor, and then we can measure um, how much it's pulling up. And as we start to calcify, the arc gets heavier, and that tells us the whole how much the whole system is calcified. And this turns out to be, uh, in this case, uh, for these two arcs in Puerto Rico, was about 15 kilograms in three months. Um, to give you a fill, uh, that would turn out to be about uh, uh, 450 grams per meter squared per year on the arcs, which is uh, pretty good. That's similar to what we see in some very nice reefs um, as measured by the cow system by Jen Smith and, and her colleagues. So they're doing pretty well. And um, that's just a great way of just watching in general what's happening with the system. Okay. The other things, of course, that we look at are things like the fish abundances and biomass. Uh, these are pretty typical of, you know, we count what's over the seafloor, what's happening in the arcs, and then what's happening in a water control, and we kind of divide them into, are they planktivores or, uh, or pescivores, et cetera. Okay. And the first thing... Right. Um, yes. There's a question about where in Puerto Rico are the arcs? Uh, Vieques, um, like right in the uh, Navy site. Yeah, we can't, we're not actually allowed to touch the bottom there. Because <laughs> the, the, it's the, the people that are helping us are the people removing the munitions out there. So uh, so we can only stay above. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so then um, with the, the fish biomass, they get there very quickly. Um, and, and we're seeing um, like really something I would say is like um, the... Uh, basically this, uh, how much fish biomass is around the, the arc. And I'll 
come back to this because this is one, um, this one in Vegas is um, where we're probably seeing resident fish. This isn't just things being recruited. These are actually things that have decided to hang out there for their life. Okay. And the other, of course, we look at is invertebrate diversity. And um, what I can tell you there is we, we get very rapid um, invertebrate diversity recruitment to the these systems. Um, and that's through passive recruitment. Okay? Um, and right now we're testing what happens if we move things onto the, the ARC systems by using these arms, these smaller little uh, things and putting them on the reef and then moving them to the arms. So that's something actively happening right now. And then finally, we're seeing uh, some that the fish and the grazers uh, or the invertebrates are actually grazing on the arc, which is um, setting, uh, which we're trying to improve on. And this is um, a project really run out of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, by uh, uh, Amy Wagner and Rosa. And uh, all the work is being do, done uh, by a postdoc named Joaquin. Uh, with Kristen Marhaver and Don. And what's going on here is um, they build a whole bunch of different materials that we might think are important for, uh, for, putting, uh, for building the arcs as well as building the arms. And then we build uh, uh, grazer exclusion uh, cages and then to, uh, deploy these things out on the, the uh, arcs that are in, uh, in Curacao. And we'll be measuring the buoyancy weights of those plugs themselves. Um, we'll be doing biological characterization. And then these guys will be doing something that's materially sciencey things, which I'm not exactly sure about, um, fancy things. Um, and that's where we are with most of this. Um, so right now we're saying that um, we're starting to see the coral reef arcs are creating conditions associated with the with healthy coral reefs, which increase includes that increased VMRs. We're seeing um, increased local oxygen levels. The corals are doing better, um, and we're of course getting um, really thinking of these as research tools. And we're looking at a whole bunch of different things. And I thought I'd show you just something about what we think might be going on with biodiversity. Okay. So the starting point for the ARCS project actually comes uh, from a very old project, which was the, uh, the ARMS project. And this was started back when I was at Scripps um, working with Nancy Knowlton, and then people uh, at NOAA did much of the uh, uh, actual work on this one, as well as people all over the world. And the idea was just to come up with something that you could set out on a reef and then just measure diversity. And what's cool about it is you set these things out and they get very they get rapidly colonized in about three years. And then we go back and we get and we count everything, uh, both the mobile and the sessile parts of it. And then we're biologists. So then we just grind it all up and then sequence it and tell you what sort of uh, uh, things were actually there and uh, what sort of molecules did they have. And what was interesting is that we really get a lot of species. So this is, uh, we've found maybe 2.5 million species on the arms that have been processed uh, so far. And there are actually tens of thousands of species on each of these arms. Um, to give you a fill, um, this is, these means it's true. Coral reefs are really the most diverse systems that we've ever uh, uh, seen at least uh, at this level, okay? And um, we estimate that if we actually had 100,000 arms, we would capture most of the world's uh, coral reef diversity. So that's the idea. So if we put out the arms, we would then would be able to move diversity onto the arcs, and then we would be able to move diversity around. Okay. So does it really matter for how the arcs uh, function? And in this case, um, what has happened is we've, put out the arcs, this is in the Vieca site, um, and just let them uh, go through successions for about six months. And then we put arms out on the reef sites and we let them sit out there for six months. And then we moved the uh, arms to the arcs and then started monitoring all the things that we normally do like VMRs and fish and so forth. Right, right. and what we think 
what seems to have happened is that um, adding the arms to the arcs may have helped establish a resident fish community. Okay? So initially what we'd seen were just planktivores coming in and kind of hanging out in here as structure. But now after, uh, since these were put out in August, what it, you notice um, around this arc is that we've got a reasonably large uh, resident fish community. And we have, of course, the big predator fish coming in. So we think that this may be because those arcs, arms sitting on the arcs are creating a zooplankton community that these guys can eat. Okay. All right, so to put it in engineering terms, I, I tried to do this a little bit for you guys because I do, I do do some of this in a different part of the world. <laughs> but really what we're trying to do is uh, something that looks like a control theory um, approach, right? And so what that means um, is that we're building out dynamical models of the arcs, which include the biology as well as the physical and chemical uh, uh, variables. Okay. Then we have chosen some state variables that we're measuring, okay, and I'll come back to that in a second, but things like the buoyancy density, uh, the, the weights that we're taking. Okay. And then what you have to do, of course, is you have to set uh, some value for those state variables and then ask how close were my measurements to my predicted values. Okay. And then, of course, you start uh, adjusting your control variables to get um, the outcome that you're looking at. For those of you that are more biologists and, are, and aren't familiar with this, think of it as a thermostat, right? You're, going, you're getting close to the temperature that you're wanting, and you want to uh, get as close without overstepping it. And so you've got a whole bunch of feedbacks going. Now, for those of you that are coming from the uh, the engineering side, the problem and what you, uh, I think a lot of people find um, a little intimidating is biology is extremely complicated, right? So this is an approach that we use, um, it's called phages. And it starts with a quality, uh, a qualitative sort of uh, approach um, of this is what I expect to be happening in the system. Then we build out uh, basically a cybernetic model of it, um, what we're interested in. And then we model within GoldSim, which is a nice place for both engineers and biologists to talk because it's a dynamical modeling system um, that gives you some stochastic uh, approaches. So you can hang out there. And then of course, after you've done this, like uh, then you usually need a modeler uh, to do things for you. Um, at, you need a mathematician at this point, but and so to get the analytical and the stats and the experimental parts. But this is basically the approach that we use. Okay? And a lot of this is outlined in this, uh, this kind of working book document that I have here. So anybody that uh, is welcome to grab it, it's just on my website and you can find it um, and you can look through it and it may be helpful to you when you're really thinking about these complex systems and how to maybe engineer and manipulate them. Right? These are the state variables that, uh, that uh, I think are important um, and, the, and some of the set points. So I've talked to you a little bit about the virus to microbe ratios and we even know kind of what that set point should be for those. We kind of, again, with the, uh, the calcification rates, we know what we're, we're somewhere where we're shooting towards. Um, I did talk about aesthetic values, but aesthetic values are important because um, if we're thinking about um, the main thing that people care about uh, coral reefs for are really shore, shoreline protection, tourism, and then food, right? So um, these three state variables capture that. And we have some fill of what they should actually be. Okay? And then of course, for those of us that are more uh, uh, interested in just the biology part, the biodiversity and the chemical diversity, again, um, these are how we would measure them. And then these would be kind of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, values we would be looking for when we do this. All right, and then these are the uh, control process variables that we're using. So of course, location gives us a lot of uh, control 
And um, that does things like, uh, it's usually around oxygen, um, which is if we put something in a high flow environment, we, get, uh, we can change the oxygen. Also, of course, lower temperatures. So if we move things to different parts of the ocean, we should be able to avoid a lot of the global climate change things and so forth. Geometry. And I showed you some of the ways that we're looking at how to control geometry. Just the arcs themselves give us a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, what I would call valuable uh, uh, geometric um, uh, variables that we're looking for. Um, the materials, uh, things that would recruit calcifiers, for example, as well as hopefully what, how to manipulate the uh, biodiversity. So that's where we're like adding the arcs uh, or the arms to bring in things as well as things like uh, probiotic stuff. All right, so the, the potentials um, where we're going with this is we're of course working through all of the things I told you and we're thinking of basically how you would make something that would become a sustainable arc park version of it. So like how many of these things would you need to break, build a functioning ecosystem where they're, uh, they're exchanging um, uh, organisms and, um, and keeping themselves. Uh, basically the idea would be that hopefully you could build enough, uh, you would have enough of them and they would start seeding each other and you would build something like a floating coral reef. Okay. Um, and of course, you could build um, arc sista, uh, like a, a series of them for restoration sort of things. So in this case, that would be to restore things like uh, the barrier functions um, that has been lost to much of the Caribbean in particular, or even uh, help build uh, systems uh, in new places, effectively the assisted migration idea. Okay? And with that, I'll, I'll just go through, like, of course, there's, there's a billion people involved here. Um, all of these guys uh, helped uh, collect all of the data. <laughs> I would, I'm going to point out um, Jason Baer. This has been, the ARCS has actually been his PhD project. And he has a Joe paper in press. So if you ever want to build one of these things and actually uh, try deploying it and measuring things on it, um, that's described in uh, uh, nice detail there. Um, this is the Coral Reef uh, Arcs Puerto Rico team. Um, less, uh, mostly, uh, this was Jess Corelli's uh, idea, and she really uh, pushed through the grant and everything that uh, did this. Um, these are the. This is another working group, uh, mostly centered out of Illinois. Um, a Amy Rosa and Joaquin with uh, at, working with Kristen and. Um, yeah, at Kermabi. Okay. This is a little bit more information, as well as a thank you to the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation and the DOD for sponsoring the work. And I will stop there and I'll leave this running in case you guys want to see a lot of the things I talked about. You can probably identify them, like where the arms and the arcs and so forth are in this one. All right, um, I'll take questions. Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, so we have one question in the chat, maybe to kick things off, which is uh, about the long-term maintenance of these things. Now you, you've talked about them as research tools and I think I can see people's uh, wheels churning in people's heads about, hmm, I think I'd like to get myself one of those. So, um, you know, what's, what's the current state of uh, deployability and operational uh, ability and if if somebody wanted to build one, um, you know, what would they be looking for in terms of time and resources and and uh, considerations? Yeah, so I think you can work somewhere. Um, imagine just to really do it, you're probably somewhere in the five to ten thousand dollar range to really because you've got all the you know the tackle and everything that you actually have to get the sand anchors and so forth. Um, the, and then the, the structures themselves is kind of a, a little bit what you decide to put on it and what you try to measure in it. Um, so I would I would say that's that's about your per uh, unit cost. Your and of course more would be better as usual. <laughs> Some of the fancier ones, like the the ones that were built by the Navy, they're going to be uh, much more expensive 
that, that like the one I'm showing here, this is probably more like a $20,000 structure. It's uh, more fiberglass and more um, uh, stainless steel. These um, are lifetime expectancies. We really don't know at this point. We've got things on there that would get them at least 10 years um, by all the ratings. So we should be somewhere in the 10 year frame. Um, the vision I have is that they're gonna, uh, I imagine them kind of being on a pole. <laughs> I don't know how else to say this, but imagine you have them anchored on a pole. And then over time, as they start to uh, calcify, they, they sink and they eventually start building um, a reef at the bottom. So you have ones above and you just keep adding until you build out a reef structure, right? So something that is very low maintenance and basically calcifies and builds out the system. That's how I really envision the long-term versions of these. And so just to kind of piggyback on that, the maintenance you're ultimately expecting the grazers and different species are, that are living on it to do the maintenance for you. You're not going out there and cleaning that off, right? Yeah, not at all. In fact, that's the rule. Um, we're not allowed to clean, or that's my rule, <laughs> is that no cleaning at all. So this is, so what we're trying to use is the geometry and, um, the, uh, and the materials to do all the work for us, right? And we're, there's still a ton to be done because like you can see it on this one, it's exactly what you would expect. We, yes, the corals are doing fine or everything is healthy, but we still have lots of macroalgae, right? So we haven't, we haven't busted open the grazing part of it yet. So we need to figure out how to get the grazers to really take over on these systems. We've got hints and we've got ideas. Um, the thing I do think that the system is doing already is the, um, it is starting to break, uh, build that uh, that zooplankton uh, loop that you need, where uh, so that you're feeding the fish uh, like the planktivore, as well as the corals uh, in the system. So we're getting some of that, but as far as the grazing down of the the macroalgae and getting just a completely calcifying system, we haven't figured that out yet. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, this is like just pretty fascinating, especially in terms of, you know, you're putting it at the same depth as areas that maybe aren't having the coral growth that or they're having coral die offs. But since it's not on the floor on the ocean floor, you don't have a lot of the sedimentation issues and some of the other issues that you typically do have a yeah. really fascinating way to do research in an area that maybe it doesn't have the best conditions to test things that you're able to go in and still be able to do that research and test things. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the challenge, right? Is that we're trying to see, so we are like right now, the two sites that we're working on are places where there were there was coral, but no coral can survive there now effectively or very little coral survives there very well now. And so um, we're trying to, again, yeah, reverse that microbialization step in some way. Um, the, it's a big challenge, of course, across uh, the whole, all these systems, but it's really hard. Um, once a system goes into that microbialized state, it's very hard for corals to make a living in, in them, right? And anybody that's, uh, yeah. The other thing that is interesting about this FAECA site is that you can see where all the corals were and historically down there. Um, the other thing is, is that there's basically no fish. Um, so if you're just hanging out, you will see no fish. Yet around the, the, the arc, there's just this big, big, gigantic schools of them at this point. And uh, for, there's a question in the chat about um, hurricane resiliency. So did you get any measurements during Fiona about the, the underwater currents or like what they experienced? Yeah, yeah. So we got, this actually went basically right over it. Uh, Fiona went right over the site um, in Vieques. Um, And yes, we do have the data and that, that they're really uh, in the field collecting it right now. So we had tilt meters um, on the on the arcs out there. So we'll know what it, what it looked like and what they felt. Um, 
it did wipe out everything on the bottom. So we really did, there was a lot of uh, uh, stuff, uh, there was a lot of force on the bottom. It just ripped the corals off uh, those, those uh, things that were anchored. Um, the ones that were on the arc, it must have been that they were, the arc was moving enough that the corals actually didn't get knocked off. Um, they were fine. Um, they didn't get scoured off. Uh, ironically, that hurricanes are good at removing algae <laughs> when they first went out there. <laughs> it's like, oh, it looks like they just scraped it clean. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hurricanes are valuable for something, I guess. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And there's another question in the chat. What what pathogens do you see? Uh, you know, that's a that so the pathogens usually are for if you're used to um uh thinking about bacteria stuff um they, these are usually gamma proteobacters which are would be most of the main pathogens that infect humans so these are vibrio like things um uh, pseudo altramonas pseudomonas sort of uh uh, types of uh, uh, cells. That's the, the cellular background. And then the phage that are going in um, are bringing in uh, toxins that we all know. So they're like shiga toxins, um, uh, cholera toxins, zot toxin. These are exotoxins that are really important in um, most, or like in bacterial uh, uh, diseases of humans. That's where it's basically things that you, you, we would associate with humans, uh, human diseases. They're almost always the same, honestly. It's just that the toxins that you build, the toxins that are useful at killing animals are also good at killing protists, right? Because they're all eukaryotic cells, if you're familiar. So what happens is that if you're a bacteria and you want to kill, or a, a, a phage and you want to protect your bacteria, what you have to do is you have to produce something that will kill off protist grazers. And that just leads to the emergence of, um, of, these, uh, of these opportunistic uh, uh, pathogens, right? It kind of is, a, I don't know how versed you are in the coral reef field, a coral disease field, but one of the, the problems has always been is that there are very few specific pathogens. I mean, there are a few out there, but almost uh, very, not many very specific pathogens. And if you look at the epidemiology, it looks like most of the coral diseases are actually caused by opportunistic pathogens. And that's just a reflection of the environment not being very good. And so it's these uh, changes in the trophic cascade um, that's really led to this, uh, this, uh, these pathogens that kill off the coral more than a specific pathogen like, uh, yeah, like the ones that we're used to, like uh, the COVIDs and the influenzas and stuff like that. But thank you very much, Forrest. We're almost at the top of the hour now. Um, if it, we're planning on sending out the recording of this meeting, um, we'll, uh, Forrest, I think, had some slides that we'll send out as well, and uh, his contact information if anyone's in interested in getting a little more information. But thank you all for joining. I don't know about everybody else, but this was fascinating. I've seen the I've seen the one in Curacao in the water, um, and it's awesome to learn a bit more just about what the actual use of it is and how it's going to benefit and be functional in research. So thank you very much for your time today, Forrest. Thank you. Super cool. Thank you, Forrest. Bye, everybody.